Hello and welcome to Carnivore Diet Success Tips. And I am so honored to have Dr. Anthony Chafee on with me this evening. Um, you know, you've been one of those in this space who I have just so respected for your, I'll say, similar message of simplicity of this. And so I know we didn't talk prior to this as to what um, I have in store for you. <laughs> so um, I would just really want to go through um, different topics of um, succeeding on this. So one of the things is the basics of carnivore. And what I love whenever I see um, your posts is your message is come into my challenge. You're going to eat meat, salt, and drink water. <laughs> and here you go. So can you tell me a little bit about your yeah. general, you know, thing with carnivore, your philosophy? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just basically trying to eat to our biological design. I, I, I don't think you need 5,000 different studies or all these different sorts of things to try to figure out what humans are supposed to eat. No animal on earth needs any amount of studies. They certainly don't need any survey trials. I don't think anyone needs survey trials. Uh, I don't think anyone needs survey studies to, to figure out anything. Those don't, don't do much for people or animals. And so, you know, we're the only animal on earth that, that doesn't know how to eat and needs a study to sort of tell us that. So I just sort of skip all that and just say, okay, what have we been eating for millions of years? What is our biological design? What's our physiological design? And I try to try to emulate that. And I basically think that if it didn't, if it didn't exist and we weren't eating it 50,000 years ago during an ice age, like I'm just not going to, not going to deal with it. And so that's, that's what I think of just the, the pinnacle. I think that's the best you can do is you try to get, you know, regenerative raised grass fed finished beef or wild game. I think that's going to be the most nutritious high fat, of course, and that's going to be the pinnacle and nothing else. And then if you want to add in other things, then, you know, you can, but at least give it a try for 30 days and just see how much better you feel. Because I, I know that for myself and for many people I've spoken to, even getting rid of spices and seasonings or just like a little side salad and things like that, they, they feel remarkably better. And so that's what the challenge is. It's just saying, Hey, look, just for 30 days, just wipe the slate clean and just say, just meat, just water nothing else see how you feel and if you want to add in other things now you at least know what that's doing to you and if it's and if it tastes good and you don't mind what it does or you don't notice it it does anything to you great that's fantastic but at least you know the baseline and a lot of people find that they they feel a lot better and they add things back in they're like oh actually that makes me feel worse so that's the idea yeah so this is what typically starts hindering people from that thought of, hey, let me just get down to the basics. But um, what is halting people really from trying it, in my experience, is uh, th this collection here, sweeteners, <laughs> cheese, coffee, heavy cream, alcohol, sauces, electrolyte drinks, any kind of dairy, and all those recipes we see popping up on our feed. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm I love the thought of go to the ultimate elimination first and mm. then gradually add back in. And here are those things that typically thwart people from wanting to jump in and, mm -hmm. and, and tackle this. And so, you know, it's really interesting to listen to people cling to their prior and we'll say addictions. Um, and when I have those, chaffles up there. They're not waffles. We're talking about the ones that are made from cheese and egg and the sauces made from, you know, butter and heavy cream. And, um, and then of course the, the, the multitude of coffee drinks where everybody's mixing their, uh, my items in. So let's talk about really what is the basic here. And for you, when you say meat, salt, water, um, there's, you know, there's levels of the ruminant meat, i.e. the lion mm -hmm. diet and the standard. So what is your um, viewpoint on in general meat? I know you just said the grass fed, grass finished is ideal, but. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, 
it's all about um, trying to get as much nutrient density and quality as well as the least amount of aggregate plant toxins and things like that. So plant animals that are herbivores that eat plants, they're very good at detoxifying the plants that they are meant to eat. But if an animal is eating plants that they are not meant to eat, then they're not going to be as good at detoxifying them. And they're going to have these toxins bouncing around their body. They're going to have different nutritional sort of composition. They might have less micronutrients. They may have more linoleic acid. They may have other little toxins that that can cause problems. And many people won't have an issue with the small amount of toxins that get through that, but some people do. So people that have uh, autoimmune issues, especially, they seem to be much more sensitive to this. The, the reason being is that the ruminant animals are four gut digesters. They ferment their food first in the first part of their digestive tract. And then they, they absorb the products of that fermentation. So a lot of these toxins are fermented, they're detoxified or lower the toxic load. A lot of these nutrients are brought out because they're made more bioavailable and they produce more saturated fat and protein just because of how the bacteria process the fiber as well. So they, they eat the bacteria, eat the fiber and they produce saturated fat as a result of, as a consequence of that. And then the bacteria die off and the animal absorbs that as protein. So it, it actually grows protein by eating fiber and developing these, these bacteria. So that's what the, the ruminant animal does. It's very good at doing that. And it's actually better at digesting, breaking down and fermenting things that it's not supposed to eat as well and not letting that get into the body. Whereas other things like pigs, chicken, fish, these are monogastrics, just like we are, it has that sort of one stomach. Uh, they don't ferment the food before they absorb it. And so they just break it down and absorb whatever they're able to absorb, you know, given the, the relevant bioavailability of the, of the food that they're eating. And then it's their liver that's filtering it out. So it has to get into the body first, and then the liver's trying to filter out this, this garbage. So that's just a less efficient way of doing it. And so if those animals are less healthy, they're eating a less healthy diet, they're going to be less healthy for us. Whereas the ruminant animal, uh, even when not eating, it's, it's, preferred and appropriate diet, it's going to be better off than another animal eating its inappropriate diet. Now, if you're eating, you know, uh, chicken that's just pasture raised, it's not eating anything else except the bugs and worms it's supposed to eat, then that's, that's going to be better. Same thing with pigs and so on. But the ruminant animals are a very good way to go because they're, they, because of that digestive system that they have and that fermentation process they put things through, they're really going to reduce the toxic load of uh, these plants and get a lot of nutrition out of them. So that's the idea. So would you say for yourself, your prominent meat source is all ruminant meat? Nearly exclusively, yeah. I, I okay. And almost... in, your, in your challenge groups, when you bring people into that first month, dig your heels in and gut it out and do this? Is it also told that you really should concentrate on ruminant meat? Well, we definitely encourage that, but we, um, at that point, you say, you know, meat and eggs, so any meat that you enjoy, that you have access to, that you can afford, that makes you feel good, uh, eggs included, then, then go for it. Sometimes people have problems with eggs, but if you don't, then that's fine. Some people have problems with other meats besides ruminant meats, but if you don't, that's fine. And always with the caveat that um, you, sh you should try it out and you should maybe try a bit of time with just the beef and see if the, if the pork or the chicken or the, or I never, I just say never get uh, farmed fish. That's they're, they're just very unhealthy and they're in horrible environments as well. And so uh, just all, only wild caught, but um, I do encourage, we do encourage people to do just ruminant meat, but at the same time, not everybody has access or the preference for these sorts of things. And, but especially people with autoimmunity, you just say, look, you really need to just stick to just red meat and water. Yeah. And so could you, um, elaborate for yourself with your groups? Cause I can tell you from my groups and my experience with many, many people, the, um, criteria of, this is the biggie <laughs> mm. because everybody doesn't want to release their 
other drinks, meaning mm. the electrolyte flavored drinks, the coffees, the protein powders with stevia mixed into their coffee beverage. So what what is your experience in trying to whittle people down to water for the health benefits of just yeah. intaking water? Uh, it can be difficult. People are, are pretty loath to, to give up their coffee. Uh, especially those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, when you're talking to people and, and they're saying, yeah, I'm having problem X, Y, or Z, you know, what do I do? And I say, okay, are you just, you know, eating meat and only drinking water? Yes. Yes. I've, I've been doing carnivore for a long time, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, or for this many weeks or something like that. And so you're trying to go through and, um, and, uh, you know, trying to figure out this and it's just like, Hmm, you know, and this isn't, this is, doesn't, all these things don't seem to be fitting. And then you sort of say like, okay, you have me anything else at all. You still, no, no, no. It's just, I only eat meat and, and that. And it says, okay, do you have coffee, you have tea, do you have electro? Well, yeah, I mean, I do still drink coffee and I put cream in it and I have, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, things with like monk fruit sugar. And it's, I was like, okay, so that's not quite you know, what Water. we were talking about. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just, people don't think about it, you know, and they, they think, no, 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 I'm just eating that. So I'm just eating meat and they don't, they don't think that coffee mm -hmm. don't realize that, you know, coffee counts. And so, you know, I was asking, I was like, okay, what exactly are you eating? Um, because if I say, are you doing a full carnivore? Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a full carnivore. Said, okay. No, but what exactly are you eating? So nothing else, no coffee, no tea, no sweeteners, no. Oh yeah. And, that, and I, I chew three packs of gum a day too, by the way. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that and they'll have uh, artificial sweeteners and they're saying, well, I'm having I'm having loose stools, but I'm eating really lean. Like what's going on? And and it's just like, well, you do anything else, all these other sorts of things. One one actually um, was um, actually hadn't, you know, did cut out all the artificial sweeteners and, you know, even the gums, which you know all cause can cause um, diarrhea. Uh, but then talking through all this sort of stuff right at the end, she said, well, you know, I do, I do actually put about, you know, half a cup of, of rock salt at the bottom of my water and then drink that throughout the day. And I was just like, okay, well, yep, that could do it. That, that can actually, that can actually do a, a little bit of a, of a colon cleanse if you're drinking a lot of very, very high salt water. So, it, you know, it is, um, it is something that you have to sort of piece through and then sort of just impress upon people that, that, um, it, we really do get best results with just the the meat and salt to taste and water. Some people do need to add more salt than to taste, especially early on. But most most people I find don't. Um, but it's um, you know it's 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 one of those things that you can have a lot of these issues. Most of the issues come when people aren't aren't quite there yet. They're not quite doing just meat and water. And they're adding these other things in. They're having these problems, and but they're not really thinking about it. And they think mm, something's wrong with the carnivore. Something's wrong with the meat. Maybe I'm getting too much fat. Maybe I'm not getting enough fat. And it's just like, and then when you find out, they're like, yes, they're using artificial sweeteners. They're using these other things. That's that's 99% of the time. That's the problem. Yeah. And your opinion on carbonated water? Um, something you probably have to look into more. I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't have particular concern with it just because I don't necessarily know of any any real concerns maybe you do but um you know, when people say about carbonated water I say look if you enjoy it and it's, it's helping you drink water then go for it maybe just don't have it as the only source of water that you have but every now and then it's not probably not that big of a deal yeah all right so cheese dairy <laughs> it's an addiction mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I find that I find that it can be definitely a, a, a source of compulsive eating where people can overeat cheese. They tend to eat the exact same amount of meat and then they add in however much cheese. And so it, they can they can end up overeating. The whole idea behind this is that uh, of eating intuitively and eating what we're designed to eat is that is that you can eat intuitively and you should be able to listen to your hunger signals just like all other animals in the wild are able to listen to their hunger signals and they they know when to start and they know when to stop and and we should be able to do that too if we're eating the right thing obviously there are there are you know biochemical reasons why and hormonal disruptions why uh eating an inappropriate diet is going to change our hunger signals with to do with insulin and leptin and ghrelin and all these other sorts of factors so but with your eating a, a natural diet, you should be able to just 
eat what you're supposed to eat, but dairy seems to mess up that equation. So people start eating more dairy, they start eating more cheese and yogurt and things like that. They tend to overeat. They tend to not know when to, when to stop, especially for the dairy. So I find that people eat generally around the same amount of meat and then however much dairy they eat. And so that, that sort of breaks that. And then, and now you really can't perfectly listen to your body on exactly how much you need to eat. Um, there are, Probably good reasons for this. Sometimes they contain carbohydrates, which can disrupt your insulin leptin uh, model. And uh, also there are very mild opiates in dairy as well that seem to cause a bit of compulsion or potentially could contribute to that sort of compulsiveness in eating. So I find that that dairy is a very, is a very um, common weight loss stall. And sometimes people even even gain weight when they're adding in too much dairy. So I tell people to be very cautious with it, especially with uh, in the 30 day challenge. We just avoid it. Um, you know, you want to add a bit of if you're getting the meat you're getting is too lean, you want to add a bit of butter onto it. Fine. I don't think you need to do more than that or like just you know eat it straight. Um, certainly at the beginning until you know what your body wants and is demanding. But the other dairy to, to pretty much avoid during that challenge period, just to see how your body reacts to it. And some people, it can be quite pro-inflammatory as well, and they can have, have other problems too. So to, to keep that away during that 30 day challenge period. And then, uh, and then to understand that if you do reincorporate it, that it needs to be a, an infrequent condiment to meat. You should never eat this on its own. If you're going to have a, a piece of cheese melted onto a hamburger patty every now and then for flavor and for, for variety, you know, that that's fine, but you shouldn't just be eating bricks of cheese and bowls of yogurt, that sort of thing. Or maybe if you had a bout of antibiotics that you had to go on having a bit of yogurt put onto meat, and then you eat that together, chew it up, swallow it to try to, you know, Trojan horse the bacteria through your stomach and, and try to get to reseed your, your colon, uh, fine, but not just eating bowls of yogurt or drinking glasses of kefir, certainly not milk. I mean, that's, um, that's just going to have way too much carbohydrates. It's going to spike your insulin and you're not going to want to do that. So it's a, uh, yeah, definitely a gray area that people should use only as a condiment and infrequently. Yeah. I find absolutely 100% for me. Um, mm. people in my groups know me very well about this, but I do not have sober behavior around melted cheese, warm cheese, <laughs> a fresh ball of mozzarella. And it really made me understand and realize that this is not something that should be in my everyday uh, world mm. of food choices. And it, 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 I've done research on it. It does have the case of morphines. It is addictive and it is inflammatory in many people. So ideally, I, I love for people to get down to the basics and do that elimination and see their own personal response to it. And likewise, I defy anybody, if you are cooking a pound of ground beef and you put on now a couple cups of shredded sharp cheddar and you mix that into the ground beef, mm -hmm. that you're not going to actually end up eating more of that ooey gooey cheesy ground beef, this like hamburger helper, <laughs> than you mm -hmm. would just plain burger. And to learn to really embrace the flavor of just the meat, it's actually really mm -hmm. delicious. And I know it's it's hard because there's so many recipes around um, things that include cheese because it, and heavy cream, right? But mm -hmm. ultimately, if you want to get to your goal, and weight loss is one of them, and metabolic health is another, then limiting limiting it just as you said to a slice when i go out for a burger i will have a slice of cheese on my burger but i don't keep it at home anymore <laughs> not yeah not good, not good yeah so. oh, probably a good good plan there yeah I, I i tend not to to buy cheese either um because you know you tend to eat it if it if you buy it and it's at your house and so yeah yeah. That's not to just, just to try to sidestep that whole situation. Yeah. And you mentioned eggs earlier as far as being mm -hmm. part of the, the meat allowable, you know, thing there. But um, obviously we know some people have allergies more so to the white mm -hmm. than the yolk. Um, and, but in general, your 
personal intake with eggs and relationship with eggs? Um, well, I eat, I eat eggs every now and then, but I, I still, it's just the vast majority of what I eat is going to be beef and then secondarily lamb. So I'll be, you know, 98% beef and then one and a half percent lamb and then you know, half a percent of everything else. But, you know, eggs every now and then I'll have, um, I don't have a problem with them. They don't react badly with me. I sort of think of them as, as, uh, you know, uh, honorary meat because they have all the nutrients that you need to build meat in, in the form of a baby chicken. So it's, um, you know, it can be quite nutritious. Pasture raised eggs are going to be much more nutritious. I believe it was Joel salad. And he said that his pasture raised eggs, um, when compared to the USDA eggs, USDA eggs had about 41 milligrams of folate, whereas his eggs had a, over a thousand milligrams of folate. So it was actually quite a large disparity in the nutritional content there. So I try to get those sorts of things and I'll have some pasture raised eggs, um, every now and then, but yeah, people do have to be cautious with that because some people can react poorly to it, especially people with autoimmunity and especially for the, the eggs that are being fed a bunch of corn and soy, because again, this is just going to go through them. They're not going to be able to filter out these nasty things that, um, that are in corn and soy that you don't want and can get in the eggs. And so some people do really do need to avoid them. And as you say, uh, a lot of that has, a lot of that is often in the whites. And so some people can do fine with the yolks and do well with that and have that be a good addition to their diet. If it's, um, if it's something that they enjoy, but uh, by by taking out the whites and just just using the yolks. But for me personally, uh, it is it is sort of infrequent. I think I'd probably every now and then I'll you know, make a steak and put a couple eggs on it, something like that. I always feel best just eating beef though, and and I think I you know if <laughs> sometimes I, I think I'd probably eat more eggs if um, I didn't have to eat so many and they weren't so small. If I get some like emu eggs and just like crack one and then go for it, that'd be fine. But Normally I have to do like, you know, 14 of these things, uh, for one, one sitting. And it's just like, it's just a, a bit more of a pain than just grabbing a steak and putting it on a pan. Yeah. Again, it can be kind of a condiment like cheese in a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Here's an, another topic that, um, seems to be a biggie for many people as far as taking away their last bit of it. So your, your opinion on <laughs> how to school them yeah. on that. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it, it's it. This one's this one is easier and harder in in, a, in some ways because it, it's it's a lot more straightforward to tell you know to convince people that that alcohol is poison because it is. You know, we know that this is harmful. We know that this causes harm, and so you just it's not like a it's not like a hard sell like telling them that you know they should really avoid spinach because it's not good for them. Like really, spinach. Uh, really spinach and, but alcohol, it's like, well, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. You know, alcohol is not great, but I enjoy it. Um, but at least they have that concept. Okay. This is bad for me. You know, sometimes you have to sort of meet people where they are and just say like, look, you know, if you, if you get rid of all the other things and you cut down the alcohol, you're, you're moving in the right direction. You know, if you're just eating meat and you're still having some drinks every now and then you're still going to be healthier than if you were eating less meat, still eating all the crap and drinking the alcohol, right? So just moving them in the right direction is, is still a positive. Um, and then with the, with the aim to sort of say, look, at some point, you know, if you just stop and do like dry July or something like that, or, or something for, for 30 days, like you'll, you'll feel a lot better and your life is going to get a lot better. And, and, um, uh, but it's a major one and it's a major, it's a major health issue, but it's also a major, way that people slip off the carnivore diet because it well it lowers your inhibitions for eating junk food and garbage and it re-addicts you to sugar and carbs and so people have have a night out and then they say ah whatever i'll eat you know uh, some sort of garbage you know street pizza or something like that and you know, maybe the next day oh well okay i broke it maybe i'll just you know binge for a couple of days on a bunch of garbage and and uh, get back to it. And so it can, it can slip them off. And I find that a lot of people, when they slip off a carnivore diet, they're doing it for you know, six months, eight months, and they're, and they're doing great and they feel amazing. And then they just like, oh, I really miss drinking. I'm going to go do that. And they, they drink and then they go, oh, okay, well, I, I couldn't do it. I guess I'm, I guess I'm done now. And I just go back to eating the way I was. And of course I tell them like, look, you know, just because you slip up doesn't mean that you're, you're off the team and we don't, we don't want you here anymore. You know, it's okay. You just get, you, you fall off the wagon, just jump back on, you know, it's okay. 
Um, and the, and like they say, the, the saying goes, you know, if you fall off a horse, you got to get right back on. The sooner you get back on the horse, the easier it is to get back on and doing it. But that is, so that's why I encourage people, you know, if every now and then you're going to drink alcohol, uh, try to keep it to like, you know, clear spirits. Don't put mixtures in it with sugar or anything like that. Trying to try to avoid beers and wines. And then that's it. Don't, don't eat the garbage with it as well. And then stay away from it. I notice that I feel much worse. I have much less energy and, and a much, much harder time working out to the extent that I like when I drink alcohol, if, like even once, even, even doing that, just the clear spirits and not, you know, getting drunk, not being hung over the next day, I find that my energy levels are completely shot for a solid three weeks. And uh, people don't realize this, that it stays in your system that long and affects you for that long. And so for me, something has to be worth not feeling my best and having poor energy for a month in order to, to drink once. So that, that, that just doesn't come up every, <laughs> all that often. So, you know, I, I, I don't, remember the last time I drank it was it must have been I don't know two years ago or more but it's it's always like that once every couple of years or so there'll be like a good friend's wedding or something like that and it's just like fine you know I'll have a couple I'll have some drinks or whatever um and uh, but not not every wedding like there's just like you know certain people's weddings like a good friend of mine that I went to medical school with and played rugby with um you know, he he was having a wedding um, and, um, and he's Irish and it's an Irish wedding. And there's the, and it's like, I can, that's an important thing to do at, at Irish weddings is drink. And, um, and so that was sort of like my, uh, one of my, uh, wedding presents to him was that, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll drink with you. He's like, yes. You know, so he's all happy about that. So, uh, I did that. And then I, the next day went like, why the hell did I do that? I feel, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel great now. And, um, and I've, I regretted it the rest of the month, but, you know, that's, that's the thing. It's, um, if you're going to do that, you have to be smart about it and you have to recognize that you're going to feel, you're not going to feel your best for about a month. And you know, is that really worth it? And, uh, to make sure that you don't slip off completely and then just start eating a whole bunch of garbage and then, then, you know, backtrack on all the, all the progress you've made. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's very difficult because a lot of people start to cross addict onto things also. So I tell people to be really cautious of that. And speaking of addictions, and um, I know this is not a popular topic here, but, um, <laughs> you know, I am pretty uh, <laughs> down a, a big rabbit hole on this coffee thing and how I, I really do believe that it uh, has negative effects, both osteoporosis, mineral levels, um, mm. sleep issues, triglycerides, cortisol. Uh, so. What is your take on this? Because I, you know, you you battle the same thing I do. I I want for everybody to feel good, and I want for everybody to get healthy, and I want you to do it as quickly as possible. And clinging to these habits, where most of the time, coffee is a vehicle for your addictive heavy cream mm. or your sweetener too. So there's a, a combination there. Yeah, it's a, it's a very common one, and. Um, and, that, and that's the thing too, you know, you talk to people saying, oh, I'm having loose stools. Um, is it too much fat? My body's not processed, not agreeing with the meat. And you always have to ask, you know, are you still drinking coffee? They, they almost always are. And so when people, you know, you go through the loose stool things, they always say, okay, okay you know, toffee, tea, caffeine, um, artificial sweeteners generally in the coffee or tea. And, um, you know, uh, even even supplements such as magnesium and then medications such as metformin you know these things can all you know speed speed the exit of your digestion and so uh they're they're it's one of those things that um that people are very reluctant to give up um it is is very addictive but i i agree with you i think it's i think it's harmful i don't think it's a great idea it's it's very bitter i think that's a big tell our brain recognizes harmful chemicals and it gives us that signal by giving us that bitter, uh, bitter signal saying, Hey, don't, don't eat this. And, um, you know, so you're tasting harmful chemicals in there. I actually have a book called, um, if it's here, it's called, uh, the most delicious poisons. And it's all about spices and seasonings and how these are actually the most toxic part of the plant. And that's why you're getting this big, strong reaction. Your brain just, it's not the plant that's taste bad. It's your brain responding 
to those heavy toxins in there and it's saying, don't do this. And so if people want to laugh, they look up the cinnamon challenge on YouTube is all these people just taking like spoonfuls of cinnamon in their mouth and trying to swallow. And you can't, you physically can't, your body just rebels against you and just like, get it out. This is toxic. And that's the same thing as doing with coffee. You know, it's, it's, it's saying that's why it's bitter and saying, Hey, look, this is bad. You know, don't eat this. And it's a pesticide. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I mean, caffeine itself is an insecticide. It was it was developed as a neurotoxin to fry the brains of insects trying to eat it, eat that plant. And, so and yet and yet it's so normalized all around yeah. the world that we bathe our microbiome in this multiple times a day. Mm. And, you know, linking to the adenosine receptors and what it does as far as your your sleep, your melatonin and Overall, I just try to strongly cheerlead people into getting it. And in my groups, we have a caffeine quitters challenge. And um, we lost you, Anthony. Are you off? Yeah. No, I, I don't know what happened there. Hold on. I'm trying to find my. Just lost connection. Make sure you have the right camera selected. I don't know what the hell just happened. There yeah, you go. Don't know what that was. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah. So you know the the challenge is it's it's twofold because it is the caffeine addiction and getting that energy that artificial boost of energy combined with typically this the sweetener and the creamer that have mm. its own addictive quality to it. And then how normalized it is socially. It's like, oh, let's go grab a cup of coffee. And yeah, it's mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's one of those things that I I'm uh, pretty adamant about getting people to at least attempt to get off of it. So, all right. Yeah. So, can you give me your thoughts on this? Because this is such a biggie in the community of, um, you know, I didn't use electrolytes all through my 15 years of carnivore. There was no such thing as electrolyte mixes and powders mm -hmm. back when I started. And it's all, it, it literally is at the point where when I have new people coming in, they're, they're buying this and taking it in every day because that's what they thought they had to do. Yeah. I've, I've noticed the same thing. I, I, I never use those myself. I've done this twice, basically, you know, 20 some years ago, 24 years ago, you know, when I, when my, professor just told us how toxic plants were and how carcinogenic they were. I'm like, yep, not eating plants, just gonna stop all of these altogether overnight. And I did. And I just, I was just eating meat and, um, I didn't have any problems and then sort of slipped off of that because I didn't, didn't, didn't really realize what, I, how significant what I was doing was. And then six and a half years ago or whatever, I, I came back to this and again, just transitioned completely completely over. I didn't have a problem with any of those things. Um, the, the idea is that when your insulin's coming down, then you're going to get dysregulation of your electrolytes in your kidneys and you're going to, and you're going to have too much electrolyte wasting. There are some studies that suggest this, but it, it, um, like that you need more sodium and things like that. But I find it's very, very rare that this happens to people. And if we think about it this way, you know, if you're, First of all, you get insulin swings every time you eat carbohydrates. So what's that doing to your to your electrolytes? Is that going to be negatively affecting these things or um, or causing you to, to retain or lose a, a, the wrong amount of electrolytes? Well, there are a lot of other processes in your kidney that allow you to hang on to the right amount of electrolytes and, and lose the right amount of electrolytes. And if you, sure, if your fasting insulin is, is creeping up and up and up over the years and decades, then that offsets that balance, but your body compensates for that. Your body compensates for that extra holding on to those electrolytes. And it has, so, okay, no, we need to actually get rid of these things. And the idea is that you, you go, you go on a ketogenic carnivore diet, and then all of a sudden your fasting insulin starts coming down and now they're like, oh, well, now you're losing too much because that's all ramped up against you. Almost like you take someone off, um, you know, and, um, antihypertensives that they have sort of rebound hypertension, but that rebounding comes back down. It's not, it's not like a permanent rebound. And so your body's going to adjust. It adjusted 
with your insulin going up because you, you didn't start with super high insulin when you were born. You know, kids, fetuses are in ketosis, breastfeeding children are in ketosis, they have low insulin. And then, you know, by the time you hit 50, now you're insulin resistant and now you have high insulin. So it took, you know, it, it came up with you it adjusts with you as your insulin is going up, but it started at low, it, it can adjust right back down again. So I, I noticed that I find that most people don't need these things. And you see people that are getting leg cramps and they're, and they're taking all the electrolytes, like all the electrolytes. And, and then and and, and to your point of saying, you know, our bodies are adjusting, right? Mm -hmm. And what's to say when you're <laughs> taking in all these electrolytes, now your body has to adjust to the fact that mm. these things are coming in. Yeah. And it's such a fine tuned machine we are. It's just incredible. You know, we only function in a very narrow range of different things and our body knows how to oust things out. So I just think this is a lot of it is people putting this stuff in, our body has to adjust to the fact that we're putting all this in and what are we doing here? Yeah, no, very good point. And, and, um, and you see people still getting the muscle cramps, they get leg cramps very commonly. And they're like, I'm taking all these electrolytes. I'm dumping salt into the water. I'm just drinking seawater. I mean, that, you know, like water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. There's a reason that that rhyme exists. And we teach that to kids. You don't drink seawater. You don't drink a bunch of salt water. It actually dehydrates you and you get worse as a result of it. You can die. And so we're doing this now. People say, no, no, you have to do this. Well, no, you, you don't have to do this. There's very few people that actually have to do this. Um, most people, most people do just fine. They regulate their electrolytes just fine. Um, that's not everybody. There, there are some studies that suggest that you actually have to, you actually have to add in salt for some people, but the vast majority of people I find don't need to do that. And especially with the leg cramps, if you're taking electrolytes and you're adding in extra salt and you're still getting electrolytes, well, it, it's clear, clearly, or you're still getting leg cramps. It's clearly not the electrolytes and the the salt that you're missing it's generally water you're dehydrating yourself and like you say you're adding in all these the salt and electrolytes you're, you can dehydrate yourself in that manner and now actually your body's demand for water increases and so you can you can it can be counterproductive to take in all these electrolytes because it's actually making you go away from the cure and so i find that in the large majority of people with leg cramps it's just dehydration and um and they just need yeah. to drink more water yeah, it's counterproductive to your wallet also <laughs> yes, yeah and and a lot of those have have those artificial sweeteners like you said you know they, they come with the stevias and the erythritols and things like and that and now that's affecting your insulin and it's it's that's where we mm -hmm. keep coming back to what i said at the very beginning it's just i love mm -hmm. the message of basic and simple and that's uh, you know one of the best ways to attack this so the next topic that uh, many ask about because there's a lot of conflicting information. Do you have um, thoughts on how you guide as far as this, or do you let people just do what they're going to do at the beginning and tweak as you go along? Well, I, I always encourage them to to well get enough fat and enough protein. You know, you need your body has certain demands, and generally, your body can can tell you what that is, what those demands are by taste. You know, if you're eating very, very uh, lean meat, which is like 95% ground beef, it gets, it gets pretty bland and boring pretty quickly. You know, chefs will tell you that fat is flavor. And so your body's saying, yes, we want those nutrients. They're outliers. I mean, sugar is an outlier. You know, it, it can be sweet and, and attractive, but that's sort of an evolutionary trap. We sort of notice that as something safe. It's generally in very low quantities you know, two weeks out of the year and we say, oh, that's safe. I can, I can eat that. But now we have it in bag form and puts in everything. And that hit that's, it's called an evolutionary trap where you, you hit this, this trigger, this bio, biological trigger. We just say, oh, that's okay. And now we're getting in massive forms and, and we, we tend to compulsively eat it. Um, and it's also addictive. It gives a dopamine hit to the reward centers of the brain. So it actually is a drug. Um, and then food scientists are really good at, at making things taste good that aren't good, you know, but, um, but things that are good for you also taste good. And that's, and that's an, a normal response. And so the food scientists sort of latch onto the, that evolutionary trap as well to find things that we say, Ooh, that that's our brain saying we want so, that when actually you don't. Yeah. Those addiction experts that are on staff are so good at combining just the right amount yeah. of fat, salt, and sugar to make mm -hmm. us, you know, 
perpetually want to buy more and eat more. Yeah, exactly. And they and they even said there was I saw a 60 minutes thing where they were interviewing some of these food scientists, very clever people. And that's the problem. I wish we could get these very clever people to do uh, things that were more beneficial to people uh, as opposed to, you know, beneficial to the stockholders of, you know, Ruffles chips. But they said, it's like, okay, we identify these these natural flavor. And that's what they say, natural flavor. They find, you know, something in there that like gives you that, ooh, I like that. That's good. This is good for me. Uh, and they take that and they change that. So you get this big burst of that flavor and it goes away quickly. So you need another, the next chip and the next chip and the next chip and the next chip because you have that, ooh, I really like that flavor and it's gone now. So I need another one. I need another one. I need another one. And, um, and so you get that compulsive eating and it's, and it's very much by design. And, um, so the, as far as the macros go, I just let people know, look, you need, you need a lot more fat than you've ever eaten in your life. You know, we've all been told that fat is really bad for us. We need to avoid it. So you need to eat a lot more fat. And most people, oh, I'm definitely eating enough fat. And then they're constipated. And so I so said, you need to eat enough fat so that you're not constipated. Uh, there are people and, and people in that, and even in the carnivore community certainly have a difference of opinion with me. But the way I think of it is just physiologically, we have a limited capacity to absorb fat based on our bile. And we have five organs working in concert to absorb fat. And there's, and it's to a limited degree. When you run out of fat, it's very difficult for your body to absorb fat. We, we can absorb some, mostly MCTs. Um, without bile, but it's a small percentage. I mean, it's a very small percentage of, of fat without bile. And so I don't think your body's making a random amount of bile to absorb a random amount of fat. I think it's an expensive resource. It's nutrient dependent. It's energy dependent. And like you said, your body works in very exacting uh, degrees and levels. It's, it's not just going to make a random amount of bile that costs a lot. Uh, to our body to make just to get a random amount of fat in. So the idea that people say is like, well, you know, you still need to limit fat because, you know, too much fat can make you fat. I just, I don't, I don't think that that's really possible. Physiologically, I don't think it's possible to overeat fat unless you're taking something like ox bile and you're forcing yourself to absorb more fat than your body has the capacity for. So once you've reached that capacity, it spills over. You have a, just an overflow valve automatically inherent in your body. And then that excess fat goes into your stools and it keeps it soft. So I just tell people, look, you need to eat enough fat so that you're not constipated. And somebody say, well, I'm getting really bad constipation. Then you have to differentiate out. Okay. Are you just going less often or is it, is it rock hard? What's well, less often? Okay. Well then you're fine. That's not constipation. Okay. It's rock hard. Sure. You need to eat enough fat. And they say, well, I'm definitely eating enough fat. And I was like, well, by definition, you're not because you're absorbing every ounce of fat that you're eating and you're not getting that spillover. Eventually, you'll eat enough fat that you'll get diarrhea because a lot of it will spill over. So just you know, don't quite go that far. But I that's what I think. I think people just need to, you know, if, and you have to cut out all the all the other things, right? You have to cut out the coffee and the tea and the sweeteners and the and the metformin and the magnesium supplements in order to see how much fat your body is actually absorbing because all those things can just make it run too fast and you won't see you could be masking the fact that you're not eating enough fat and so that's what i try to tell people just eat intuitively eat until fatty meat stops tasting good our hunger signals change for a variety of reasons but when you stop eating carbohydrates and sugar you can actually listen to your hunger signals and they are much more subtle and so you have to relearn them and I think that it best goes by taste, you know, animals in the wild, they eat, they eat, and then just something tells them to stop. And I've noticed in, in us that that goes by taste. And so first bite of that steak, it's the best bite of the night. And then it has negative feedback. It tastes slightly less good each time until it finally doesn't taste good at all. And eventually you get to a bite where it just tastes like cardboard and you just go like, well, that's weird. I don't really want to keep going. And that's your body telling you that it's enough. We have sensors in our tongue taste. We have sensors in our stomach that track up to the brain and and actually can track the macros and micros in your stomach. And so this is this is why the idea that back in the 80s where they said, oh, just eat a whole bunch of fiber, it has no nutrients, but it has bulk. So it'll make it'll trick your body into thinking that you're full. Never went anywhere. Everyone was just starving and bloated at the same time. And uh, that's because your brain actually knew that there were absolutely no nutrients in there. Well, now it does. And so you're eating these things and eventually your brain just says, yeah, that's enough. We don't need any more. And you take a bite and you just go, ugh, I don't really like that. Fun. And you could, you could keep eating, but it's very difficult. I mean, you'd have to force feed yourself and it'd be very uncomfortable. So I try to just encourage people to do that. I've never counted macros. I've never counted 
you know, protein or fat or anything like that. I've just eaten intuitively. And if I started getting a bit, you know, blocked up, then I just, I up the fat and, um, you know, bring it down if it goes the other way. And then now I have a pretty good idea of what my body requires. And so I don't, I don't have those issues anymore. All right. So let's go on to your thoughts on this because a lot of people are very confused and, um, still, not knowing what to do because of conflicting information out there. Hmm. Well, so I, I think it's, um, it, you can look at it sort of as, as a staged approach. You know, if you're coming from a standard American diet or a, pl a, a plant-based, well, standard American diet is a plant-based diet, but even like a vegetarian vegan background, and you haven't been supplementing heavily, you're going to be nutritionally deficient. You just are. Um, you can catch up by being on a carnivore diet. And I never took vitamins or supplements or anything like that. And a couple of years into it, I checked all my vitamins and minerals and they were all in, in optimal levels, uh, which are above the reference ranges for these things because the reference ranges are just the average for the community and the average person is malnourished and sick. And so when you look at the reference range for people that are actually in good health, that those are very different reference ranges. So in those good health reference ranges, I was in there just by eating meat and not eating liver or had liver four times in a decade at that point. I've, I've added a bit more in now just because I actually like the taste of it a bit. And uh, so I'll infrequently have some liver. But the um, the nutritional content of the standard diet or a plant-based diet is really, is really poor. And so when I see my patient population come in and we test all their bloods, they are always extremely deficient in a lot of things. And so if someone is critically deficient, like their B12 is at a level that you can actually get demyelination of your axons, I am going to give them a shot. I don't think that's safe to let them out of the office without give them, giving them a B12 injection, a methylated B12 injection. And, um, you know, other than that, uh, I always tell them like, look, you know, you, if you, if you do this diet right and you just eat, eat a lot of meat, you know, all of these things are going to catch up. You know, if it's too low, I'm just like, look, you can just, just pop it up just from here. But if it's, uh, you know, other than that, it's like, look, this will come up on its own, especially if you add in a bit of a liver, kidney, heart, those sorts of things, very nutrient dense. That really is supplements for a carnivore is a, is a bit of organs because they're so nutrient dense. I don't think you need to overdo it. I think you still keep it in proportion of the animal. If you go out hunting for, again, doing this naturally, if we went out hunting, we took down a buffalo uh, and that's got meat on it. It's going to last you two years and it's got one liver, one heart, two kidneys. So try to keep that in mind and keep that in proportion. Again, grass fed and finished are going to be much more nutrient dense than grain finished. So actually the micronutrient levels are going to be lower on a grain finished cow. So, you know, a bit more organs might be a good idea in that case as well. Um, but if, if people, just eat meat, have a bit of organs every now and then. It doesn't have to be much. You're going to catch up and you're going to get everything you need and you can certainly maintain at optimal levels. If you are very deficient and um, and you're first starting out in this and you want to take some dedicated um, supplements to catch up, then that's your business. I don't think you necessarily need to do that, but I wouldn't do it for a long period of time. You do it for a couple months, you get up into the levels you need to be, and then your diet maintains you, or you just add in a bit of organs. And I think that's usually the best, the best way to do it. And then you check your levels, you make sure you're good. And then, um, and then you just go on with it, but you can certainly just do it just by eating meat and you will catch up eventually. It just may take a bit longer than, longer, than if yeah. you were more aggressive with it. All right. So how about fueled versus fasted workouts, cardio versus weights, maybe differences mm -hmm. between men and women or postmenopausal women? I don't, I don't think there's a difference between men and women or pre and post menopausal. I think we're just all, we're, we're all humans at the end of the day. And that, uh, you know, the same sort of principles apply to everybody at, a, at any stage of life, you know, just like they would at, uh, you know, a, a lion, male lion, female lion at any stage of, of their life, they're, you know, they're doing what lions do. And um, as far as uh, I never, I never uh, eat before I work out. I just, I just intuitively figured that one out uh, in my, in my youth and in my playing days, I always played better if I was fast. And I was told my teammates was like that uh, they should, they should play hungry. You, know, you play hungry, you're going to have that little bit of an edge and aggression. And I sort of thought of it in, in a sort of a, a natural way as well. It's like, hey, you know, your, your body's telling you to go out and kill something, hunt and fight. 
And so it's giving you that energy, that edge for it. And when you eat something, it's sort of, oh, no, we're good for the day. We don't need to do this. And I, I sort of thought about that uh, at the time. And I, I think it's it's uh, more true now. But I certainly noticed that I felt much better. Even when I skipped dinner the night before, I would always feel much, much better. So I'd eat sort of earlier in the day. Sometimes I wouldn't even eat the day before. I felt better if the longer I, I was away from eating, especially when I was eating sort of a normal diet. When I was on a carnivore diet, first of all, I was really under eating because I just, I never felt hungry. And I, and no one told me that, you know, you had to go by taste and their hunger yeah. signals are going to change. I have, I have a question about that. I have, um, one of the members in my group was, uh, mm -hmm. asking about being underweight and mm -hmm. he's low carb, very active, um, three months now, very low carb. I'm still encouraging the full carnivore, but mm -hmm. um, having issues with underweight. So multiple yeah. meals, um, anything that you suggest? Yeah, well, you have to you have to make sure that they are eating every day. Um, trying to if they're working out heavily, try eating twice a day, <laughs> and remember that to go by the taste thing, because there's a big difference between eating until you feel you can stop, which is what we normally do, because we only have to do that or you'll get fat. If you're eating carbs and all this other crap, you have to eat and you go like, well, I could stop. And so I'm gonna stop because that's, that's how you're trained. You know, the Japanese have this for, you know, for hundreds of years, this, is this thought that you stop eating when you're 80% full, right? Yeah. Because that's, yeah. you, you, have to, you have to limit yourself. And if you are deranging your hunger signals, then you do have to limit yourself and you do have to say, well, I, I, I've taken the edge off. I can stop here. That's not what we're doing here. You want to eat until your body's telling you it's done. And so you eat until fatty meat stops tasting good. And those are two very different points. And, and um, you know, I don't think you have to get to the point where you're stuffed and you feel like vomiting or anything like that. I've heard people say that. And I, I don't think that's a good idea. You should, you should, that gives you an unhealthy relationship with food and you're also, your body's telling you in no uncertain terms. Don't do this. That's not normal ancestrally anyway to stuff no. ourselves. So I have a couple questions. I'm going to see if we can squeeze in. I know we're getting short on time, but there's a question here. Dr. Berry recently spoke of the AHA's report that fasting is dangerous. What's our individual thoughts on this? Yoshinori Yoshi wants an explanation. Yeah. No, I think that I think that's absolutely bloody nonsense. You know, there there are literally thousands of studies on the benefits of fasting. There are population studies, you know, religious groups that fast regularly annually for you know Lent or Ramadan. Uh, they absolutely have much better health outcomes, and and of course we're well adapted and and um, designed to to be able to fast because animals in the wild don't have constant access to food all the time and especially predators you have you have to go days or weeks sometimes before you go and kill that's why we have a gallbladder because it's storing bile and it's concentrating you up to 20 times its concentration because you may not be able to get meat and fat for several days or even weeks or so you know cougars and mountain lions in america they they average about one deer a week right so <laughs> what does that do oh my god it's so bad you don't want to fast um, I, I don't know what it is. The, the AHA, they, they've been sellouts from the beginning. I mean, they started out as sellouts. You know, the Procter and Gamble bought Crisco from Germans who used uh, Crisco as a tank lubricant in World War One, and then they paid the AHA twenty million dollars to lie and say that it was better for your heart than than animal fats such as lard and butter. Um, they were also paid off by the sugar companies to uh, misrepresent the data on uh, cholesterol and, and blame it for heart disease. They misrepresented the Framingham study, which I was taught in medical school showed that. Uh, higher total cholesterol was associated with higher levels of cardiovascular uh, mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality rates. That's what I was taught. It's not the case. The Framingham study actually showed the opposite, that lower total cholesterol was associated with higher cardiovascular disease mortality rate. The AHA misrepresented and lied to it under the pay of the sugar company. So literally anything they say, I'm going to, I'm going to completely ignore because they are, they are, they're just industry, you know, they're an absolute front for, there's like the, you know, front for like a mafia. It's always, money it's money. always follow the money, follow the money, be smart, yeah. pay attention yeah. and follow the money. Cause that's really yeah. the, the answer to, and, and the reason why we have to be skeptical of everything.
So, yeah. well, I know well, we're at the top of the hour and you need to go and head off to your meeting. And I so appreciate your time. And I am um, just so grateful to have another in this carnivore space who really uh, supports that message of simplicity and getting down to the basics so that you can feel better faster. So, yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. And it's good. It's good to see you in the space as well and getting, getting more and more people's out, especially clinicians and doctors, because, you know, it was, it was definitely rare, uh, but now I'm seeing more of it. It's really nice. At first I had patients coming in saying they had breast cancer and their doctor said, you know, their oncologist said, stay away from meat. Don't eat meat. Just go plant-based because of all the estrogen that's in, that's in meat. So you need to go and eat soy instead. And I'm like, really, have you, have you really actually looked into that at all? And, um, and that's how it started when I first got to, to Perth, the people telling me that. And then um, a few weeks ago, I had a patient come into my office and she said she wanted help optimizing her health and with carnivore diet and checking her bloods. And she said that she came to a carnivore diet because her oncologist told her that she needed to go carnivore because that was the best diet that was going to help her cancer. And so I think we are moving in the right direction and we're starting to, to get some uh, some more people on our side, which is really good. Yeah. And unfortunately the standard of care is, um, often not what our message is. So we can get ourselves in a little deep water sometimes. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so appreciative of all the other medical professionals out here who are standing our ground and talking about this and trying to get the message mm -hmm. out. So thanks so much. Definitely. And, um, hopefully we will be able to, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to come on to your, um, yeah. your membership group and, uh, be a guest speaker there. I'm looking forward to that. So I'll see you yeah, then. Definitely. Great. All right, great. You Thank you. Thank you.